I will say something about your film that I really love is I love going to New York. My husband and I are visiting in early March. We're coming up to oh, right. those. Yeah. And your film made me really uh, miss it, even though I've never lived there. So I don't know the abject horror of living in a place that's like big. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I have to say, Sorry, man. Uh, <laughs> I, I am a little obsessed with Troy. I, I am, I've seen it like, all the like digital queer festivals that were playing this past like fall, like I saw it at Outfest, New Fest. I I think it was playing at Holly Shorts too. It was, yeah. It when I had when I covered that film festival, I think the specificity of it and how gay it is and how um there's stuff in this movie that made me that makes me laugh every single time I I watch it and uh, I'm trying to work. He's going to wear out his asshole into the headline somehow. I haven't figured that out yet, but I'll figure it out. I look forward to that. Yeah. <laughs> My so, mother will be thrilled. So She'll send it to all her friends. So long story short, love the movie. I'm, I'm, I'm very happy. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, not to ask a general question to start, but I, I did want to ask uh, where this idea came from, just because it does feel like a story that like a good friend told you about um it's something that uh feels very um what's the word it feels like some, there's an ex it's experienced in this story as so i was curious where it came from yeah uh it, it isn't part a lived experience actually really okay i a little bit of it i mean the certainly the premise um jen silverman and dane laffrey who i you know work with oh, a yeah. ton of theater uh and the three of us came up with this story and kind of like beat it out and structured it together um it, there there was an apartment in our past uh in their past that had a, a, a situation with a neighbor and you know the couple <laughs> is very different and like with the journey they go on is very different but like mm -hmm. the initial idea and i guess like a few little details it is also like there are a set of ideas in the short about you know becoming overly comfortably settled in a routine and the kind right. of like need for intrigue and um, mm -hmm. for something to wake you up when you become a little stifled and numb. Like those are always things that I'm sort of interested in, okay. in, in work. Um, and like some of the ways that they, uh, you know, kind of lose themselves in this fixation on this guy and the degree to which they start projecting and like mm -hmm. the imaginative life of that, like that, that is stuff that I'm, I'm sort of like always very drawn to. Okay. Yeah, it's um it reminded me of uh to a certain extent, even though the plot is nowhere near similar. <laughs> Go with me here. Um it reminded me of um Manhattan murder mystery a little bit. It's oh so sure, totally. That's, that's my favorite of his who we we shouldn't say his name, um uh movies um that I used to be really obsessed with about how you know that sort of um you let your imagination run wild and you sort of uh, totally I, I used to watch that movie all, all the time as a like as me a, too. a kid yeah. like there's something about the the spiraling of the imaginative life <laughs> and how joyous it is and how like how much that can connect you to other people and how alive yeah. that can make you feel that uh i think is very human i actually joked the first time i watched it about the connect uh, the connectivity that it has it uh i started calling it um only fucking in the building because <laughs> it reminded me of how in the first episode of only murders in the building they all connect over like i listen to this podcast i listen to that and they like get totally. something so, um that, <laughs> we take that as a title too it's great <laughs> that's good yeah I'm, i have a list i'm workshopping them all great. um i this is gonna sound like a very sort of flippant question but i legitimately want to know I yeah. love when the couple starts hearing it, or well, I imagine they've been hearing it for, for a minute, um, but, you know, this is part of their routine now, you know, letting it silently build their frustration and maybe like pounding their, you know, their fist on the door. Um, but I, <laughs> the, uh, the specificity of what we hear from next door is very, very funny. And I was curious what you can tell me about like, the direction of that just because um it's not just moaning we hear very specific things and i think 
the the build of that is is actually very uh funny uh thank you <laughs> some of it was very specifically set in the script as we worked through oh, really? it like okay. we there were certain things we were like oh well when they're having a birthday dinner with the, her mom it has to be this and this is like the high-pitched keening thing that just like cuts <laughs> through everything at which point you can no longer deny that you're hearing the thing um and then our our incredible um ad like we mostly didn't work with sound while we were shooting sometimes i would call you okay. But for that, he actually provided that sound. And it was so in like divinely inspired that that kind of like set what it was. But a lot of it was sort of found through the editing process and like juxtaposing, okay. like figuring out like what sort of really sang with this moment. And we had a sense of the journey for the opening, but to be honest, we had to score the whole thing with temp tracks to really figure that out. And so okay. I spent, because I couldn't, I like couldn't ask anybody else to do this. It seemed like too horrible. I, I spent a couple <laughs> days um, sitting in my apartment, like combing through porn and ripping audio tracks from porn, and building a library of different sex sounds so that okay. we had a library to play with as we were editing. And then we went and we had like a, a very strange. Um, set of recording sessions with Florian, the actor who plays Troy, and our producer actually, who's also an actor and another friend, where we um, created tracks based on some of that stuff. But okay. uh, I, the library is extensive. Like it's broken down cool. by like rhythm and pitch. And like, if there's an animal that feels, you know, like if something <laughs> is particularly like a porpoise or like if there's ad-libbing and the nature of the ad-libbing, like mm -hmm. when we, got into recording sessions we started to realize like we should play with some of like what the dialogue might be given that like some of this is a client uh relationship so i i we really did go down a bit of a rabbit hole <laughs> um getting specific about that stuff i was you know making up some questions and i was just like i'm gonna sound like a giant pervert to just be like but tell me about the direction of all of troy's uh banging like I, there's that because there has to be a variety so i went you know it's it's worth asking about um, totally well and it became important to get a sense i mean truly it became important to get a sense that there's a duration of time like a real mm -hmm. duration of time that this is taking place over and so like if there isn't a real sort of like melange of different soundscapes you lose that sense of like wow this is really like day night for weeks and it's just mm -hmm. like hundreds of different partners and like it never sounds the same hopefully so yeah i i actually expected i was like i'm gonna hear a bicycle horn at some point that's what's it's just i'm just gonna hear it it's gonna happen um i'm sure we have that track somewhere which yeah. is <laughs> an oversight um, yeah <laughs> um i did want to ask about I mean, I feel like I know why just because it works better this way, but I want I wanted maybe to have you expand on the idea. I love that I love that the couple never interacts with him. Like the most that they interact interact with him is he has his headphones in or when she is at the bodega and he sort of uh brushes her presence off. And um I was wondering if you could tell me if that was always like that or was there maybe a possibility where they did interact? Um, I feel like the mystery of who he is is a real driving force of the story, but I was wondering if maybe you could uh, comment or expand on that. Yeah, I it was pretty clear to us from the beginning that they should never actually get to interact because I think so much of it is the version of this guy they build in their imaginations mm -hmm. and the moment they actually get to interact with him that kind of shatters the imagination if it doesn't line mm -hmm. up with exactly what they've pictured there there was like a moment or two where he did speak to them like there was a mo there was a version of the bodega scene when we started shooting where he actually like responded to her and it, it pretty mm -hmm. quickly like revealed itself to us over the couple a couple days of filming that like we actually should never hear him speaking except when we're listening through the wall that like even <laughs> him talking to them felt like too much of um an interaction but I, I think the other thing that felt important about it was that you know for this young couple he begins to take up such a disproportionately large like mythically <laughs> scaled uh, you know sort of like space in their lives right. and for him 
I, he barely notices them. And I think the discrepancy between how much he means to them and the degree to which like he might actually never realize they're there mm -hmm. uh, also felt really interesting to us. Yeah, it's sort of like um, a sort of hot facade of of Troy. I I would I feel like um, I would like to. It's probably the facade is hotter in my head than if I ever actually met the, the <laughs> person behind behind the wall. I guess I would say. Um, I did want to ask about. Um, <laughs> this sound really uh, sort of formal, but I I don't know like queer masculinity um i feel like there is an idea of there sorry i can't even figure out how to phrase this it's just sort of like um he's troy himself is going through something very very emotional and mm -hmm. i feel like in a lot of queer narratives especially things like maybe you know beyond five or ten years ago um we don't really delve into that and i think it's really interesting how I get an emotional journey of Troy even though he doesn't talk to us and he does represent the sort of like um uh, queer bro muscly dude who um I would probably uh, horribly just assume he has an OnlyFans online I don't know there's something about the totally. way film tackles um hearing his emotions because we hear him crying we hear, him, we hear his anger um but i was wondering how you wanted to sort of explore that in a non-traditional way because i think that's what um is, was really compelling to me as, as a gay man yeah uh, thank you for that i um i think two things one it was important for us that we really get a sense of troy as like a fleshed out person i feel like one of the exciting mm -hmm. things about the the device was that we could still figure out how to create a really fully carved out person even though you're barely ever getting access to that guy <laughs> uh, and so being interested in seeing him go on like the the sort of like the rangiest emotional journey possible felt very exciting to us but i think the other part of it was that um it's it's not just like the really hot stuff that you like get inappropriate access to by living in a place oh, yeah. like this city where you're on top of each other. Mm -hmm. It's like you're sometimes you bear witness to people's like most private, raw, ugly, like emotionally bleak moments. And, and, it's something that is like, I, I don't know, it like, it, I think it, it kind of like unifies all of us in the city. Like the number of times I've watched someone break down in tears on the subway, the number of times I've been crying uncontrollably on the subway. Like, it's just, it's something I think that like you have to do because you don't have the privacy or the space sometimes to like be where you are emotionally. Yeah. And um, the intimacy of their access to that felt even more dangerous and interesting and exciting than them just hearing him have sex, which is, you know, certainly like yeah. one thing it feels, you know, like not appropriate, but um, when the friend is listening to him leave that voicemail, like that I think is kind of like the most That's uncomfortable and invasive yeah. moment in the whole thing, actually. Uh, like we're not yeah. supposed to let other people do that. Um, so that that felt really important. Huh. And I like how you can sort of see how the straight couple is, this is, you know, hearing his raunchy stuff you, for so long, you know, the fact that they are taken aback by how emotional it is, that makes it, that adds another layer because it's sort of like, it's like one of those things where you you find yourself acknowledging that you are emotionally invested in it, but you realize that you've been sort of emotionally invested in it the whole time, almost. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, the lack of like, I don't know, the, the, I felt really bad for him, the, the rage in his voice, that sort of, um, that really sad anger, loneliness thing. I feel, I always say like anger and loneliness probably live a lot closer than we're more willing to uh, totally. accept. And, um, I don't know if you're not allowed yeah. to express that all the time. It probably comes out in a harsher way. I don't know. Totally. And I think it is that, I mean, I think they, the, all three of those people are dealing with a kind of quiet but profound loneliness, which I think is the thing that ultimately
ultimately kind of like resonates between all of them. Mm -hmm. I also think he's just somebody who, for whatever set of reasons, like he lives in like big swings and like has <laughs> a, like the highs are high and the lows are low. And I think like Taya and Charlie as a couple live, especially at the top of the movie, in like a really narrow bandwidth of experiences and emotions. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think one of the gifts that they get out of their relationship with him is like higher highs and lower lows mm -hmm. in, in what you can experience in the everyday world. Oh, okay. I mean, <laughs> any sort of thing that they hear coming from the other side of the wall, it does live in like an extreme. You never, you never hear him, you know, ordering Grubhub or anything like no. that. No. <laughs> you, you never hear like a casual thing. When they when they see him where he is um in a more casual headspace, he doesn't acknowledge them. Um he doesn't or he he just doesn't realize that they're there. Um I also have to say just a random sight thing that I really loved in the movie is when they are in the laundry in the laundry room and he's just keeps pouring like a ton of Clorox into the washing machine. I, I thought that was really funny. Um, <laughs> um, I wanted to know how you sort of, when Thea realizes how emotionally, like she feels bad for him and she's, she's um, taken aback by how invested she is. How did you sort of want to work with that character, like taking baby steps towards him? Like, um, I had forgotten after the first time that I watched it, when I watched it again, I forgot that she tapes the the granola bar or the protein bar onto the door. And I was, I kept thinking, I was like, he's going to see it. Like, he's going to wonder who taped this to his door. I was curious um, how you wanted to um, take little, like, little nibbles at, like, acknowledging, like, the loneliness and the connection. Yeah, I think a lot of it was breaking down some of this was work that Jen and I were doing and structuring the script, but a lot of this was work that Dina, the actor and I were doing in scoring the shifts from irritation and imposition to curiosity, to mm -hmm. fascination, to obsession, to a little more personal information that hooks her a little bit more to like getting access to his despair, which changes her investment in him in a deeper way. Like she, she goes to curiosity pretty quickly in that opening montage yeah. um, mm -hmm. in a way that mm -hmm. her partner doesn't. Um, but I think a lot of it was also about finding, like, I think one of the things that's activating for her is um, being increasingly bolder and a little more reckless about mm. her interventions. And so part of it was finding like the scale of, okay, well, it's one thing to like, choose not to knock on the door, but slip the letter under because he's clearly going through something. It's another thing to like put on a song to try to like buoy him or like energetically send like warmth and affection through the wall. It's another thing to actually like tape something to his wall or like create a grinder profile. <laughs> um, so trying to just like, I, I, like find those little escalations into increasingly more absurd or outrageous behavior still grounded mm -hmm. in something very yeah. human like a, a little more um reckless yeah okay i have to say the like the, there are a couple of moments where i like when, when she creates the grinder profile and she you can see how she is like trying to talk like a gay man to like a gay guy in the middle of the night i thought that was really it's very pointed but it's also really uh it's peppered with such like um i keep saying specificity but it's it's sort of like the the point of view of her trying to uh put herself into the the head space of that and it also reminded me of the the scene on the roof where they're talking to like a gay couple and the gay couple's like laying it out for them is like felt so honest like i feel like i've had conversations like that with my friends um that is just uh a very true thing that i uh this this movie is very sneakily true for um for me so um forgive my gushing about it um no, yeah i appreciate it <laughs> um i guess one last thing before i let you go um 
I've always been sort of very sad about the ending and when she walks into his apartment. Um, and I don't know, like, I don't want to ask, like, do you hope Troy is okay or do you think he's okay? But I kind of want to ask, do you think Troy is okay? Um, just because he's such a part of their life for so long and to have him suddenly be um, absent is uh, very striking to me. So I was curious if you uh, believe Troy is okay. I, I I think I choose to believe he is. Okay. Um, because I think I, I think he's gone through like such a rough ride in these like quick <laughs> sixteen minutes. But I think that space. I think his apartment feels like it's become so toxic for him and his life in that apartment. His experience of where he is in his life is so toxic that I, I think. I hope it's not fleeing because he can't like afford it or he's like running away from the city. I, I choose to believe like he's leaving that place for a bit of a fresh start, which also doesn't mean that like he has to give up his work. Like, but I think it's maybe something about like that space that there has to be a bit of a clean break from that relationship that he was in. Mm -hmm. um, but okay. yeah, not necessarily. I don't know. I feel, I feel like we're, we're trying to walk a very like, um careful necessary line of like not putting judgment on the work that he's doing yeah mm -hmm. um there's something about in the argument that he has um that i think is actually really good that you, you that it's in the script is when we hear him say to his boyfriend or partner he was like i make more money this way like it's not like like that's like a real thing that some people i just read an article yesterday like on buzzfeed about how you know a content creator and like how much money they make and they they interviewed like 25 people on a different variety of of things so it's something that um i feel like after the pandemic raged for so long like it's it's like a, an alternative that some people uh realize that it's actually part of their life that makes so, sense. totally i i um, have actor friends who who couldn't work for a couple of years because of the yeah. pandemic. This is like actually a very legitimate way that they make very good money. Yeah. Okay. So. Well, uh, thank you for letting me gush at you for 20 minutes. Um, I think the, <laughs> the image of, um, the image of her hugging the wall is a very, uh, I think that's a very universal image. And I think it's, especially after all the shit that we've been going through in the last couple of years, um, unexpected connection and kindness is very important but it the movie doesn't you know hit that home in a cheesier cliched way i think it's a very grounded very touching sort of thing so uh thank you for that <laughs> thank you i really appreciate that it's so yeah. lovely to get to talk to you today yeah i've i've been um a little this is one of my favorite movies that i short films that i saw at um at film festivals and every single time it popped up i watched it each time and it's just oh it's thank you good so uh forgive my dorkiness but yeah <laughs> i love the movie thank you for uh taking the time to talk to me and i'm glad that it's playing at sundance more people can see it yeah <laughs> all right well um, uh thank you so much. yeah yeah thank you uh stay safe have a good rest of your day and all that jazz yes good luck. you okay. as well all right bye, bye.